So back to the webinar itself, um, as you know, EMIS has a long history of interoperability with third party applications. Currently, we work with more than 170 um, third party products, including decision and prescribing support. Today, we'll be looking at how to enhance your medicine reviews and optimization using two evidence based tools, the stop start and the AGS beers criteria. Uh, that's me at the top. We've um, actually just uh, turned the videos off because it was causing a bit of bandwidth um, challenges, but that's a picture of me at the top there. I'll be covering the first initial few slides looking at the, the challenge of inappropriate prescribing, um, introducing two criterias, and then how the clinician uses the tool within EMIS Web. And joining me today, I'm delighted to welcome Jerry Moran, the Chief Executive of CSIS Healthcare, who will pick up the second part of the, the webinar, looking at the case studies and clinical trials across the NHS, as well as the analytics dashboards. So looking at the problem of inappropriate prescribing, uh, it affects one in three older adults. It creates nearly 100,000 hospital bed days and is potentially the fifth biggest killer. So why is this happening? Um, well, the, the backgrounds of this, the backdrop won't come as any uh, big surprise to you. The current estimates are that there are nearly 12 million people over the age of 65 in the UK, and this figure is expected to increase by 40% over the next 20 years. On deeper inspection, that figure reveals that there's over five and a half million people over 75 years of age, a figure again that's set to almost double over that same period. And studies have found that half of the patients receiving care are taking six or more medications. Now, clearly patients with multiple comorbidities may require the prescription of many medications, but the importance of this collective impact on polypharmacy on the individual cannot be overlooked, with polypharmacy contributing to an individual patient risk of um, falls, episodes of delirium, prescribing errors, and hospital tendencies as a, res as a result of adverse drug events. And the over 65 five years population currently accounts for about 65% of admissions into secondary care and the majority, about 70% of bed days at any given time. So we believe that there's about a billion pounds that could be saved by addressing some of these needs. I should make it uh, clear, of course, that inappropriate prescribing is, is not really a choice. Um, there are multiple interlinked factors which contribute to the complex decision making process that's undertaken when prescribing a drug. And this is amplified in older, more complex patients. So in, in short, um, absolutely GPs and other clinicians are working hard and in the best interest of the patients to address this very complex task. If you look at the majority of evidence-based guidelines for care, they are largely drug to drug or single disease orientated and not really suitable for patients with multiple concurrent diseases. And existing trials omit the multimorbidity and polypharmacy patients. So to highlight an example of that, 57% uh, of patients with heart failure also have hypertension. So a single disease guideline may advocate the use of verapamil as an appropriate treatment for hypertension. But the problem with that guidance is that verapamil is also an inappropriate um, treatment for heart failure. So it may actually worsen that patient's condition. And at present, Clinicians rely on clinical judgment when prescribing and reviewing medications for older complex patients. However, guidelines and screening tools um, are beginning to emerge in the clinical forum, which are aimed at helping clinicians to predominantly avoid those harmful prescriptions in the older populations, but also consider their prescribing of useful and beneficial medications. And the two main forerunners to this are the stop start and the AGS beers criteria. Uh, just to introduce those, both of these criteria have been created by geriatric experts across the US and Europe, and they are validated by the Delphi process. The Beers criteria was first developed in the early 90s uh, and comprised of a list of 30 medications to be avoided in nursing home patients. The criteria was subsequently updated in 2012 by the American Geriatric Society, giving it the, the full name of the AGS Beers criteria and now includes over 150 uh, evidence-based prescribing rules, which are divided into three categories of potentially inappropriate medications. And these are those to avoid, those to avoid in certain diseases, 
and those to be used with caution. And the second criteria is the stop start. Um, they are both acronyms. The stop is the screening tool of older persons prescriptions and the start is the screening tool to alert to right treatment. The stop start criteria was devised by a panel of 18 expert prescribers in older people from uh, a number of centres across Europe. It's now endorsed by the European Euro Union Geriatric Medicine Society. There are nice guidelines that recommend the use of screening tools such as Stop Start. And it's also referenced in se several national toolkits, the NHS England toolkit for supporting older people living with frailty and the NHS Wales strategy to improve care by optimising medicines in the elderly. And the last point on this slide um, which is identify potential prescribing admissions. Um, this is really, a, a, is really unique. So most prescribing tools will alert for contraindications and medications to stop or avoid during a, uh, a review, but not the start criteria. So this will actually identify those medications that have been omitted and can actually help the patient. So in short, this isn't really a, a, a criteria around cost analysis. This is primarily about patient safety. And what they seek to achieve uh, is to provide a real time patient centred medication review. Optimising the prescribing by identifying those potentially inappropriate prescriptions, uh, pre uh, prescribing, sorry, uh, identify potential prescribing emissions, ones that have been missed. Reduce the polypharmacy where possible. Reducing the adverse drug events and hospital emissions and also support this complex task for clinicians. And as a final point on this uh, slide, uh, neither tool is a substitute for a for, for clinical judgment or keeping the patient at the centre of care. So, for example, if the criteria recommends stopping all six medications and starting six brand new ones, the GP will obviously wish to do this in a structured, considered manner over many months or even many years, rather than um, putting the patient on cold turkey. Uh, this is a simplified example of, of patients and their comorbidities. So as we mentioned earlier, two of those, so a single disease guidance may recommend the appropriate prescribing of furosemide for patients with heart failure. And in patients who have hypertension, a second condition there, the guidance will prescribe verapamil. But with patients with both of those conditions, these can be considered inappropriate and could cause an adverse drug event. And as you can see from this slide, the further down you go, the more pa uh, conditions the patient has, the more drugs that are prescribed and the more that um, more complex it becomes and the, the likelihood of inappropriate prescribing grows at, at every point. So I hope you're still with me <laughs> through that sort of deep dive or a, a bit of a dive into the criteria and what they're all about. Um, I want to step back a little bit um, and just touch on some of the national schemes that are also driving the use of these tools and how it interacts with the context of, of EMIS Web. You'll be aware that part of the new GP contract uh, and the DES, the Directed Enhanced Services, there's also a need uh, and funding available to undertake two particular schemes. One is the structured medication reviews and optimization, and the others is the medicines optimization in care homes. These are aimed to directly tackle over medication of patients, including withdrawing medicines that are no longer needed, as well as support medicines optimization more widely with a particular focus on some priority groups, which uh, include, but not limited to, asthma and COPD patients, learning disabilities and autism, the frail elderly, care home residents, and patients with complex needs and taking large numbers of different medications. So hopefully you recognise that that's just what we've talked about in those previous slides. It really does address many of those object, uh, objectives nicely. And this is why the Medicines Review Solution by CSIS is very interesting to us, um, starting at the top there with that patient review. All the disease and medication code changes are updated in real time, so just a matter of seconds. The software will review the historical prescribing and it's all analysed at the point of medication review to provide that helicopter population view so you can see the prescribing challenges before you even start to apply any of those rules. The medicines optimization teams and clinical pharmacists can then set a strategy to address the certain categories and these could be um, 
physiological systems. So it could be looking at the digestive, respiratory or circulatory systems, could focus on conditions. So heart failure, hypertension, kidney disease. You may wish to look at the types of medications that are being used, so beta blockers, statins, ACE inhibitors, etc. Or indeed look at high admissions due to adverse drug events, so strokes, bleeds and falls. Once those rules are set during the medication review with the patient, the alerts, the alerts will indicate the medications to stop and of course the ones to start, which is unique. The full articles uh, and provenance can be checked by the clinician before making any changes and they always remain in control of that uh, patient um, consultation. The outcomes are recorded and they're looped back into that analytics so that the optimization teams and, and clinical pharmacists can then review progress, address any <coughs> exceptions and slowly over a period of time apply new rules. And I'll just emphasize that last point uh, again around applying new rule, applying rules over time. So if there are any GPs on this call, um, I'm sure there are, um, you'll all agree as soon as I start to mention alerts, you'll immediately fear alert fatigue. So it's important that uh, teams set a strategy to address specific areas and then build up on those over time. We've got a, a demonstration of this and how it looks within EMIS Web, which I'll just play now and um, describe what's actually happening on the screen. So this is a screen that many of you will be familiar with, uh, EMIS Web. Uh, for the purpose of this demonstration, we've selected a, a less complex patient. It's uh, Mr. Paul Murray. We can see from his record that Paul is a 72 year old male with a history of heart failure, hypertension and chronic pain. And his medication currently includes a beta blocker, calcium vitamin and a painkiller. You can see already that in your introduction to Paul that this software has carried out a full medication review and presented the clinician with a notification window with two alerts. By clicking on that notification window, you can expand the screen and view the alerts in detail. So for the purpose of this demonstration, I'm going to show you how to resolve a stop alert, how to resolve a start alert and how to make alert an exception where the clinician deems this is appropriate. So this stop alert recommends stopping the NSAID in the patient with heart failure. So here I'm going to stop that medication. I'll then add in a reason. and a code. As you can see, the software picks up this change and removes that stop alert. So this time I'm going to resolve a start alert. In this case, the recommendation is to start an ACE inhibitor for this patient. And I'm going to prescribe Ramipril. Once again, the software picks up this change and removes the start alert and the notification windows disappeared. Now, during this consultation, the clinician may have also identified that the patient has osteoporosis. So now we're going to add this to the patient record.
the software again recognizes the change and then recommends starting a bone therapy. But in this case, the clinician may want to wait until the test results have been received. So what the clinician will do is they wish to add an exception for this alert to a later date. The clinician can set a date, and in this case, the test results are due back in a week. So I'm just going to set a date for a week's time to review. The results are, are refreshed and that alert again disappears from the notification window. To view any of the exceptions for a patient, you can click on that view exceptions button. And if needed, you can remove the exception for that alert. And by doing this, you'll see that it appears again in the notification window. So I hope you can see from this short demonstration that it's uh, an intuitive system. It, it really does require very little training uh, and the clinician at all times remains in control. So now what I'd like to do is introduce and hand over to Jerry. Um, Jerry will take over and talk through the use cases within the HS and some of the clinical trials that, um, that they've undertaken. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> just to talk a little bit about uh, a use case summary uh, that took place within the NHS. Um, one of the things uh, it's important to note is that the criteria, both for the AGS and the uh, stop start criteria, have been developed by clinicians. What CSIS has done is uh, has put the uh, clinical algorithms and the software uh, to them. Um, so in this particular case, there was uh, 75, uh, oh, the category that was selected was uh, over 75s uh, in this particular CCG. And uh, 50 uh, uh, soft start uh, criteria were selected. Um, the purpose of taking 50 as opposed to the 100 is so as to avoid uh, alert fatigue, as Jamie alluded to earlier on. Um, this ran for a, a six month period and there were 2,652 um, uh, alerts triggered. Now th uh, those alerts thing could have been triggered uh, quite a number of times. So, but uh, there was uh, 2,652 individual alerts. The patient cohort uh, was 17,167 and there was uh, six plus chronic conditions. Um, bearing in mind that there would be an awful lot of um, uh, other patients uh, and as I said, we're looking at the multimorbidity patients uh, in, in this particular case. Um, so, uh, 1950 uh, reviews uh, were completed uh, only out of the, uh, the 17,167. So, the financials that we are uh, speaking about here is only reflecting the 1950 um, patients. So, the uh, clinicians that were involved in the in the, in the in the trial, uh, they they came to the conclusion that they prevented at least 88 hospital admissions out of the 1950. Um, and if you were to uh, put that into monetary terms, um, and the average stay in in the UK for uh, such a patient, an ADE patient, is um, is nine days. And if you multiply by 400. Uh, then you're looking at a saving of 316,800. Uh, on top of that, you had uh, medication stopped to the value of 287,000. So, 
to summarize the slide uh, in effect is that it doesn't do justice to the uh, the full uh, savings that uh, can be attained considering that there was only um, 50 soft start alerts used as opposed to uh, soft start and AGS beer criteria combined would uh, would be 250 the uh, exercise also only lasted for a six month period as opposed to to a 12 month period and so the, uh, the the real savings is significantly more and also uh, the the maths are based on 1950 patients so uh, when we talk about a saving of 604000 uh, per uh, typical ccg where you have two, uh, 275000 patients um, uh, this is grossly understated, but nevertheless, uh, that would be the absolute minimum that you would ever expect to to achieve. And the net cost to uh, to a CCG is one hundred sixty five thousand, which also includes um, the nursing homes within the region. So you have all your nursing homes and all your uh, your practices uh, covered. Uh, this is a clinical trial that actually took place, and um, uh, uh, to to, I suppose, uh, look at practices and uh, monitor practices uh, at uh, death discharge and at six months later. Um, there was um, quite a bit of work that was required to, to, uh, to arrive at the, the, the cohort of patients because they had to uh, marry together male, female, similar uh, ages, similar uh, conditions, etc., uh, similar medications. So it, there was quite a lot of work in it, but it, this was also published and, and peer, peer reviewed. So you will see the intervention, which is the red, which basically happens is that the, when the patients into, uh, into the hospital, that's within 72 hours, they were all reviewed. And uh, you can see that there was a significant drop in, their, um, in, in the, uh, on the, on, on the graph. Now, uh, MEI on the left hand side is is the medication appropriate index score. So the lower the score is, the more appropriate uh, the prescribing is for the patient. The likelihood of ever reaching zero is uh, probably slim. From the point of view is that uh, clinicians do intentionally inappropriately prescribe based on risk and reward. So. If you look at the um, at the intervention group uh, at discharge, uh, they were uh, fully compliant, uh, bearing in mind that uh, typically a patient entering hospital um, uh, from primary care has somewhere in the region of 37 percent of the of the patients entering the hospital has one or more drug inappropriately prescribed or one or more drug omitted. So that group. Uh, uh, had had their uh, were fully reviewed, and you can see how they performed at discharge two months later, four months later, and six months later. Uh, the control group uh, went in; they had the same level of inappropriate prescribing uh, going in, and the same level of inappropriate prescribing coming out. After two months, uh, two months it still remained the same. There was a slight dip, and then it was uh, it went back up again to. To where it was originally. Uh, one of the conclusions that uh, uh, was also drawn by the group that uh, reviewed this behaviour is that there is a, a reluctance on behalf of clinicians to change medication uh, of their patients from once they are discharged. Uh, we uh, installed it in the system in. Um, in the GP's practice, and they wanted to be able to see themselves uh, how they would behave in this particular uh, set of circumstances. So they had a patient um, which was uh, frail, uh, and um, the alert came up. So this, they wrote back to the uh, the consultant in the hospital, and it says that um, with the technology that uh, we have here, uh, it's basically saying that you're inappropriately prescribing. And the consultant wrote back to the GP and said to them, yes, you are correct here, but I have done it in, the, in this particular case, it's risk and reward. And 
they said in most cases uh, you would be correct, but um, there are occasions when I have to do it in the, in the best interest of the patient and in consultation uh, with the patient also. So the, the analytics, uh, the analytics suite, and Jamie uh, spoke about it uh, earlier on, uh, the analytics that's available at a, a regional level, at a CCG level, is also a, a carbon copy that's available in the practice. So every report that's uh, can and population stratification is available there uh, to be seen. The only thing that the practice won't be able to see is how other practices are performing. They'll only be able to see how they are performing themselves and how the region is performing. So uh, it identifies uh, the prescribing gaps. It's totally patient sen uh, censored, uh, as you uh, as you have seen earlier on in Jamie's demonstration. Uh, it operates at a point of consultation and it operates at a population level. At all times, even though you have only 50 alerts uh, showing to avoid alert fatigue, it is also grabbing all of the information uh, in relation to all of the other criteria that's there. It's, the fact is, it is just not displaying them during the consultation process. But what it is doing is that it is continuously populating, which allows the clinicians uh, or, the, or the administrators to set a strategy for the future. As uh, you could have a situation whereby the, somebody might think that we have a, a major problem with bleeds, for example, and um, or we don't have a major problem with bleeds. But then when they, they look at the, um, the, the analytics, they find that the, the, the problem is uh, much worse than we had anticipated or it is much better than we had anticipated. So now you're dealing with fact rather than opinion, and it's all, it's all live. So, uh, you can see all the recommendations, and they can does they can take the um, uh, take the necessary action. Uh, what it also does is that it it, it tracks uh, prescribing behaviour, and at all times you can see uh, who is making the changes and um, uh, when and when they decide not to make the changes. So this is a, a, a population. Um, uh, uh, risk stratification. Uh, typically, what, you, uh, what we're looking at here is that a, a region will set a strategy, and in this particular case, you can see from the drop-down menu, it's uh, focused on over 75s, and it's also also time fixed. Uh, also, what you can do with this with this report is you can say to yourself, okay, I'd like to be able to see all the patients on a particular medication, or I can like to see all the patients with a certain age group with particular conditions. So there's multiple permutations and combinations that you can actually uh, uh, work out in terms of your <coughs> excuse me, in terms of your strategy. Uh, just taking this slide, uh, if you look on the on the right hand side, you have 49 patients. And if you flip over to the left hand side, you can see that they have eight plus alert. From, from this, you can also see that there were six uh, fully resolved, and the the balance is at various stages uh, with uh, seven with one unresolved uh, alert. You have eight with two unresolved alerts, and so on and so. On. What this does is that it gives a very good picture at a regional level uh, the status of and the size of the problem and the progress that has actually been made. In the in in the process, but in this particular case here, you can see that uh, there was uh, nine thousand six hundred and sixty-five patients, and you can see in the bottom right hand corner, and um, this uh, had one or more alert. So it was quite significant in a cohort uh, of uh, something over seventeen thousand people. This is a, a, all in all, there's uh, 80 different reports, but inside those 80 different reports, there are a multitude of other uh, reports available. Uh, this report here is just showing an individual named uh, Doe 1. Um, 
this this is a natural patient's alerts, but the data that's been shown here uh, is a fictitious data. Um, and when we talk about provider here, we're talking, we're talking about at a practice level. So in this particular case, you can see that on the first occasion where you see count under 77, uh, on the first occasion that the uh, uh, patient's record was opened, uh, stop CV3 was resolved immediately. Uh, then uh, the patient's record or the patient had come into the practice uh, for, on four occasions before um, the bottom alert uh, was resolved, which was beers 58. But the message we're trying to get across here is that number one, you can uh, have every piece of information that you can have uh, in relation to the patient. You can see who is treating the patient. And um, you know the, the purposes of or the, the causes for the alerts. And the other important factor is it is highly unlikely that a clinician will ever uh, resolve uh, all of the alerts uh, in one go. It will probably take maybe six months, maybe in some cases, maybe even 12 months if you're having somebody with uh, um, eight, uh, eight alerts. And as Jamie said earlier on, if somebody goes in and uh, resolves all of those in one sitting, uh, you could actually kill the patient. So it's, uh, this is very much a decision support tool and it's providing the information to the clinician at the point of consultation. And it's the final decision is there at the end of the day. Uh, this is another report here, which basically shows uh, a list of the patients and uh, and this would be more of a, like a, a, uh, a report. Uh, but when we say not provider, we're talking about uh, a, a particular GP practice or South provider or East provider. And it's a summary dashboard which uh, will tell you the status of each of the patients within that uh, within that practice. Okay, to, to summarize, um, uh, reducing polypharmacy. As everybody knows, uh, the whole area of polypharmacy and multimobility is, is very challenging uh, for clinicians. And if uh, a clinician uh, were to uh, achieve the standards that are set out uh, using the AGS beers criteria and the uh, stop start criteria, they would have difficulty getting through one or two patients. Um, and the reason for that is that because of the, the complexity and the, the level to which we are taking uh, the medications relative to the conditions of the of the patients. So it's, uh, it's extremely challenging uh, for clinicians out there. Um, in terms of stopping uh, uh, inappropriate medication use, uh, it's very, very clear that it's operating to international best practices. Uh, all of that criteria has been published and in the course of, um, of, of the consultation, uh, and if the clinician is in any doubt, there's uh, hyperlinks there supporting the recommendations. So effectively what is happening is that uh, you have uh, research papers plus uh, 31 uh, clinicians that has been involved in the uh, validation of the um, of, of those recommendations, and they're saying this is how we would prescribe based on the uh, data that will be in front of you. So, and likewise, the same thing is for the the missing drug treatments. Uh, nobody out there uh, will do a review and identify missing drug, drug treatments electronically. On top of that, all of this uh, reviews is taking place inside three seconds. So from once somebody opens up the screen, uh, it, we immediately uh, do a full review of, of the of the patient. And uh, <coughs> say, for instance, that it's over 75s, they would just pick out all the people over 75s and it will do a, immediately do a review of them. Uh, there's a significant saving from a, from a hospital admissions perspective. And uh, what also uh, it will do, it will give confidence to the clinicians that when a patient is discharged from hospital, that uh, if alert comes up, um, that they, they can feel comfortable going back uh, with the data and saying this is the reasons why, uh, or ask 
why is this patient on this medication? This technology is, is telling me different. And there's research papers here to support us. So um, it can uh, develop very positive communication between whether it's the pharmacist or whether it's the clinician and the consultant within the hospital. Uh, it significantly re will reduce um, uh, medication er errors uh, at, at the point of prescribing and, and even at the population level. And, and also, we say it's, um, it's supporting medication adherence. Uh, the review itself is, is structured as, um, as you possibly can have uh, with the, uh, the data that has supported that, that, um, uh, that review. And it's, it's done and it's, uh, it's uh, developed to the highest possible standards and it's classified as, uh, as um, a class one medical device. And it is registered with the Irish Medicines Board in Ireland. And likewise, it supports um, the, the care home reviews. Now, one of the other things as well that I think is worth uh, mentioning is that um, there's some published papers in, in pertaining to uh, COVID-19. And uh, if you look at those research papers, and they have identified certain cohorts of, of patients, and all of those cohorts of patients with uh, underlying conditions are cared for uh, uh, using uh, the technology that we have uh, developed here at the moment. So that's it for my, my side, Jamie. Great stuff, Jerry. Thank you very much. If you can go on to the next slide, we have got some some questions that um, between you and I, we will try to answer. So the um, the first one, uh, <laughs> maybe I didn't uh, describe it very well at the start, so apologies. The first one is, what is CSIS? Is it software on EMIS? Um, so just to explain, CSIS is a third party company. Um, a separate organization it's jerry is the chief executive of that business they have developed the, the the medicines review solution that's their software and what they've done is they've gone through the emis partner program and they've created a, an interface into the emis web clinical system so it's software that you can enable on emis web but it is a separate third-party application so i hope that that clarifies there's another question similar um, just asked uh, asked us to repeat, um, where was it? How to access Stop Start from EMIS. So Jerry, could you just um, describe how you actually get to Stop Start from EMIS? I don't understand the question, uh, Jamie. How do you get <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. And I think the answer, so the answer I think really is that actually you don't need to access Stop Start. The, the medicines review solution is is there. It works in the background. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> I didn't quite understand. That's all right. That's all right. Yeah. It, it's, it's, uh, from, from once the, the medical record is, uh, the patient's medical record is open, it is continuously operating on the background and every change that the clinician makes uh, it's it's running there also. So the only changes that they will actually see is the changes based on the alerts that they have decided to uh, to have uh, or to show to the clinician. So in other words, if you have decided on uh, bleeds or falls or things like that, and then all of the alerts that are associated with that uh, will um, be shown at the point of consultation. Whilst at the same time, and let's say for instance, that's um, um, 15, 20 rules, then the, the other uh, 220 rules is still uh, being populated in the background. And that uh, allows uh, uh, the CCGs or the practice to develop those strategies going forward and say, this is our next big, biggest problem, or this is, uh, uh, this is where we should be uh, refocusing our attention. Great stuff. And, and related to that, Jerry. Um, someone has asked, will the software run by itself or is there any action needed by the GP IT team? Uh, no action from anybody. It's, it runs on its own in the background. Fantastic. Uh, is it classed as a medical device? Yes, it's a class one medical device in accordance with 9342 EEC and uh, the competent authority in Ireland established medicines board, which is the HPRA, which is the equivalent of the MHRA in the UK. 
fantastic. And might as well cover this one off. Does it work with any other clinical systems? How dare they? What are the clinical systems? <laughs> Uh, your competitor, yeah. Yes, yeah, it does. <laughs> absolutely. So if you have a CCG with a mixed uh, mixed estate, then absolutely it can work across different clinical systems. Great. Uh, can the CSIS tool be used in, uh, in conjunction with any other national recommendations such as PINSA? Uh, yes, uh, uh, we have had requests from uh, uh, some CCGs uh, where they're saying that they will have uh, local prescribing and things like that, and we can incorporate these separate things as well also. Great stuff. And um, what about uh, the, the operation? So can the alerts handle suggesting a defined local formulary option, not just a class of medications? Uh, not at the moment. We, we we just deal on uh, medication classes. Great stuff. And is the stop start tool live in EMIS now? Uh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to add on that, it's a, yeah, it's, a, it's a, as I mentioned, it's a third party application. Um, by all means, reach out to your EMIS account manager, they can help talk through how it's set up um, and the, the pricing associated with that. But it's it's available for anyone using using EMIS, app, EMIS web. A um, couple more questions. Does the stop start recommendations take into account any drug allergies or sensitivities before making any rec recommendations? Yes, uh, relative to the rules, yes. Great stuff. Um, I think you probably cover this off a little bit later with the analytics, but is a search possible for a group of patients using the stop start tool? Well, oh, yeah, I mean, the, uh, the, 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 that's, a, that's a functionality that's, um, that's there. Uh, so you can, um, you, you can segregate out just the stop start from the, the beers, if that's what you're asking. Uh, asking. Uh, but also you can select um, the particular rules. Yeah, I think you covered this in the analytics, which, which is in the background, it's collecting all this information every time the medication record is, is accessed. Um, then you have the analytics to be able to really drill down to um, patients and cohorts that you wish to focus on. And as you saw, showed in one of the screens, what alerts and exceptions have been uh, are being dealt with, which ones are outstanding. So I think there's a lot that you can drill into. And well, those... Be, 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 yes. Yeah, sorry. I was just going to ask the, the alert, sorry, the dashboards and analytics, who has who has access to that? Is it just uh, meds optimization teams or is there any visibility at the practice or federation level? Uh, that's entirely up to the CCG uh, to decide, but the, as I mentioned in the presentation, the dashboards and the re all of the reports that are available at the CCG level are also available at the practice level pertaining to the practice itself. They do not do not have visibility of any other uh, performances. That's at the CCG or where uh, they would do or decide where uh, the strategy should reside. Um, in, in, in the case of a, of a CCG, the, all the data is anonymized at a CCG level. Uh, and then, but what they'll be able to do is they'll be able to take that anonymized data uh, because they'll be able to identify the practice. And when they go to the practice, uh, they will be able to identify the patients. They will be able to walk in and say, we have uh, eight people uh, with uh, a plus alerts, they run off a rep uh, the same report uh, inside of the practice and then to be able to identify the eight patients. Great stuff. Uh, another question says, is the software... So, 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 so I just want to reiterate that all the data is anonymous at the CCG level. Great stuff. Thanks, Jerry. Um, another question that asks, is the software uh, real time so that when they are adding a new medicine, it will tell them whether they should stop or start this, uh, whether they should stop this medication. Yes, it's real time down to about three seconds. 
So, uh, so when somebody uh, makes a makes a change, uh, then the record can be updated inside three seconds. Great stuff. There are a lot of questions around, which is great. How do I get it? How do I switch it on? Um, a few people trying to do it now, I think, as well. They're actually on their Emus web system going, I'm, I'm trying to find it. Where is it? Um, the best thing to do for those that are asking those questions, please reach out to us, um, either your account manager or through the, the support desk, um, make an inquiry. We'll also obviously follow up after this with um, uh, updates to the questions and answers and also uh, contact details with a contact form. Please feel free just to drop a note to us and we'll come back to you about how we can get this um, enabled, how we can um, talk to you, talk to whether it's a practice, PCN, uh, Federation or CCG or, or CSU, whoever it may be, about getting this enabled within your, your practice. There is a charge for it, so it's not a free service. Um, there's huge value to be had from this, so it's not something that uh, that is free. It's, um, I say it's a third party um, software developed by CSIS Healthcare. Um, so delighted to see, I think it's 46 questions so far about how do we get this, which is wonderful. Um, so I'm really pleased there's a lot of interest in in um, moving this forwards and, and getting it enabled within um, practices and CCGs. Um, th that sort of covers off the most of the main questions, uh, Jerry, around um, the use of the tool. I say questions around the, the how to um, get hold of it, which is which is great to see. Uh, if there are no further um, questions uh, relating to the software itself, um, I think I'll probably draw the the session to a to a close. There, um, a few people asking for specs actually and, and further information. So uh, we'll definitely provide links on the follow up. There will be a contact form on there. Um, Jerry, if you could just click on your slide deck just to the final slide. There should be uh, an email address there. Yeah, there it is. So please um, feel free to take note of that that email address. Um, drop an email to us. Uh, it's a central e a inbox that we, we will pick up. And we'll make sure we come back to you with further information and, and of course happy to go through the, the pricing and implementation of this. So um, so once again, uh, Jerry, thank you very much for, for presenting and, and showing us more about the medicines review solution. And thank you very much for everyone dialing in this afternoon. Um, I hope the sun remains shining wherever you are. Um, have a very good afternoon and thank you very much. Thanks very much also, Jamie. Thank you. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks.